Hello, this is uh, Dr. Lloyd, Chapter 11, The Muscular System. So um, we are going to go through many, many muscles. And each muscle has, has an origin and an insertion. But right now, I'm going to go through the muscle names so we can learn them. And then on Saturday, I'll go ahead and uh, go through the origins and insertions. Okay, so skeletal muscles produce movement by exerting force on the tendons. And a tendons attach uh, to and pull on the bones, and movement occurs. So I have shown here the biceps. Uh, when the triceps contracts, the forearm moves away, and when the bicep contracts, contracts, you get a uh, forearm movement towards the body. Okay, so most muscles cross at least one joint and are attached at the articulating bones. So when a muscle contracts, it draws one bone towards the other. So the origin is the stationary bone, and the insertion is the movable bone. So for example, the triceps brachii, the origin, is both the scapula and the humerus, and then it inserts in the ulna, whereas the biceps brachii originates from the scapula and inserts on the radius. So the muscles act as levers on these bones, and uh, there's resistance and there's effort. So what's important to learn about the levers is the fulcrum, the effort, and the load. So there are three classes of levers, class, first class, second class, and third class. First class is when the fulcrum is right in the middle, and you have balanced effort and load. Second class is when the fulcrum is at the distal end. And third class is when it's at the proximal end. And each of these levers exert different amounts of force and movement. All right, so... Um, Muscle is arranged in fascicles, and these are muscle fibers uh, in parallel bundles. Um, the fascicular arrangement correlates with the amount of power the muscle can produce and the range of motion it can produce. So the arrangement of fascicles can be parallel or fusiform. So parallel fascicles uh, are parallel to the longitudinal axis of the muscle. And uh, at the end, or either end, you have a flat tendon. An example would be the sternohyoid muscle. Uh, the effusiform, like the digastric, we have a big belly. So the fascicles are nearly parallel to the longitudinal axis, but terminate on a flat tendon. And so there is a tapering of this muscle where the diameter is greatest to the belly, and then it decreases. Circular. So the fascicles, in concentric circular arrangements, they form sphincter muscles that enclose an orifice, like the orbicularis oculi. Triangular. Fascicles spread over a broad area, converge at a central thick tendon. Gives it this triangular appearance, like the pectoralis major. Penate are short fascicles in relation to the total muscle length but the tendons nearly extend the entire length. So you've got unipennate, where the fascicles are arranged on just one side of the tendon, bipennate, where the fascicles are on either side of the tendon, and then multipennate, when you have several directions, several tendons. Coordination with mus within muscle groups. So most muscle movements are coordinated um, with agonists and antagonists and synergists. So, um, for example, the biceps brachii, when it is contracted, the triceps is relaxed when the, and that allows for flexion. When the triceps contracts and the biceps relax, you get extension of your 
forearm. So the muscle naming is complex. It can be determined by location, size, number of origins, appearance, direction of fibers, origin and insertions, and muscle action. And so today we're really going to focus on uh, all of these except for the insertions and origins. What I want to do is to introduce all of these muscle names and how to figure out their location, size, number of origins, and then we'll work on the origins and insertions uh, in class. Okay, so characteristics used to name muscles. So let's go through some uh, examples. Rectus is parallel to the midline, like the rectus abdominis. Transverse or perpendicular to the midline, like the transversus abdominis. And obliques are diagonal to the midline like the external oblique. Okay, relative size, maximus largest, minimus smallest, longest long, brevis short, latissimus wide, longissimus long, magnus large, major larger, minor smaller, vastest is huge. Deltoid triangular, trapezius trapezoid, serratus sawtoothed, rhomboid diamond-shaped, obicularis circular, pectinate comb-like, piriformis pear-shaped, platys flat, quadratus square and four-sided, and gracilis slender. Flexor. This is on the principal action. It's going to decrease the joint angle. Extensor will increase the joint angle. Abductor moves away from the midline. Adductor moves closer to the midline. Levator raises or elevates. Depressor lowers. Supinator turns palms anteriorly. Pronator turns palms posteriorly. Sphincter decreases the size of an opening. Tensor makes the body part rigid and rotator rotates bone around a longitudinal axis. The name also has to do with the number of origins of the tendon. So biceps brachii has two origins. The triceps brachii has three origins. The quadriceps has four origins. OK, uh, it can also be named on the structures where the muscle is found, like the temporalis, or the temporal bone. They can be named by the insertions and origins, like the sternocleidomastoid. It originates in the sternum and clavicle and inserts into the mastoid process of the temporal bone. Okay, so these are all important muscles. I cannot find one that is not important. So I would get comfortable with this figure. We're going to go through these muscles. Here's a posterior view. Once again, all these muscles are important. OK, let's start with the muscles of facial expression. Now, these muscles are a little different because they pull on the skin instead of on bones. So when they contract, the skin moves rather than a joint. So occipital frontalis, temporalis, Abicularis oculi, levator libi superioris, zygomaticus minor and major, rhizorius, platysma, depressor anguli oris, and depressor labile inferioris. A little bit deeper, we've got the uh, bucinator and the masseter. as well as the orbicularis oris and the mentalis. I missed one up here, the corrugator supercilli. Okay, looking at the uh, lateral view, we've got temporalis, occipital frontalis posteriorly, masseter, chewing, Occipital frontalis, 
Orbicularis oculi, Zygomaticus major, Zygomaticus minor, Levator labi superioris, Levator anguli oris, Bucinator, Orbicularis oris, Rhizorius, Depressor labi inferioris, Mentalis, Depressor anguli oris, and Platysma. Okay, muscles of the eyeballs. They're uh, extrinsic eye muscles um, because they insert onto the sclera of the eye. And there are three pairs of these extrinsic eye muscles, the superior and inferior recti, lateral and medial recti, and the superior and inferior obliques. So here we can see the superior oblique, levator palpebrae superioris, and the superior rectus, as well as the medial rectus, the lateral rectus, and the inferior rectus, as well as the inferior oblique. Now the lateral rectus moves the eyeball laterally, medial rectus medially, inferior rectus down, superior rectus up. Inferior oblique is going to be uh, make kind of a rounding motion, superior oblique. This is going to be an upward rounding motion. Okay, muscles for mastication. So this is chewing. Uh, temporalis, big chewing muscle. Um, medial pterygoid and the lateral pterygoid. Okay, the tongue. The tongue is critical in uh, mastication, taste, swallowing, speech. The tongue is attached to the mandible, the styloid process of the temporal bone, and the hyoid bone. So here is the tongue, and uh, below it, the genioglossius, geniohyoid, posterior, styloglossius, palatoglossius, and inferior hypoglossius. Muscles of the neck. The suprahyoid muscles elevate the hyoid bone. The infrahyoid muscles depress the hyoid bone. So we've got uh, digastric. There are two bellies to this. Uh, stylohyoid, sternohyoid, omohyoid, thyrohyoid, and then this mylohyoid. Muscles of the neck that move the head. Semispinalis capitis, spinalis capitis, splenius capitis, and sternocleidomastoid, as well as a longissimus capitis. Muscles that move the neck. Okay, muscles of the abdomen that protect abdominal viscera and move the vertebral column. So the anterior lateral abdominal wall is composed of skin, fascia, and four pairs of muscles. These are the rectus abdominis, the external obliques, the transverse abdominis, and the internal obliques. We look at a superior a uh, deep diagram, we've got innermost intercostals, so between the ribs, um, internal intercostals, external intercostals, and the diaphragm. And these uh, intercostals aid in breathing when we need it. Muscles of the thorax, the internal intercostals, external intercostals, Diaphragm or orientation. Caudal is quadratus lumborum. Just a different view 
showing the diaphragm and the external and internal intercostals, as well as the innermost intercostal. Okay, uh, this inferior view shows the diaphragm and a number of large vessels. Coming down here is your vertebrae to orient you. So the pelvic floor, very complex. Uh, this group of muscles associated with fascia is called the pelvic diaphragm, stretching from the pubis to the coccyx and from one lateral wall of the pelvis to the other. So this is a female pelvis. Uh, we can start with the external urethral sphincter, ischio cavernosus, compressor urethrae, bobospongiosus, sphincter, urethra vaginalis, superficial transverse perineal, external anal sphincter, levator ani, which is the pubo rectalis, pubococcygeus, and iliococcygeus, as well as the ischiococcygeus. So the perineum is the region of the trunk inferior to the pelvic diaphragm, it's diamond shaped. It extends from the pubic symphysis to the coccyx and the ischial tuberosities. So this is a male. Uh, we start here at the top, uh, ischial cavernosus, bulbospongiosus, um, external urethral sphincter, deep transverse perinea, superficial transverse perineal, external anal sphincter, levator ani, the puborectalis, pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, Here's the gluteus maximus to orient you. Okay, muscles of the thorax that move the pectoral girdle. Levator scapulae, trapezius, subclavius, pectoralis minor, serratus anterior, Okay, uh, muscles of the thorax and shoulder that move the humerus, deltoid, supraspinatus, subscapularis, coracobrachialis, pectoralis major, teres major. All right, to continue, muscles of the thorax and shoulder that move the humerus. So uh, deltoid, supraspinatus, subscapularis, Brachialis, pectoralis major, teres major, latissimus thorsi. That pretty much covers the humerus. Okay, uh, looking at posterior view, we see the deltoid, teres major, cracobrachialis, latissimus thorsi. Triceps brachii, infraspinatus, and supraspinatus. Okay, muscles that move the radius and the ulna. We can start with the biceps brachii, the brachialis, the triceps brachii, and the anconius. You're looking at a transverse section of the arm, we can see the different compartments. We've got uh, the triceps brachii, triceps, uh, the long head, the medial head, and the lateral head, uh, the brachialis, and then the biceps brachii, the short head and the long head. Okay, muscles of the arm that move the radius and the ulna. Brachialis, brachioradialis, anconia supinator, and the protonator teres, pronator quadratus. Uh, 
Muscles that move the wrist, hand, thumb, and digits. Pronator teres, brachioradialis, palmaris longus, flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, extensor carpi radialis longus, flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor pollicis longus, pronator quadratus. Looking at the anterior view, this is pretty deep. Here's your supinator, flexor digitorum profundus, flexor pollicis longus, and the pronator quadratus. Okay, uh, continuing with the forearm, the extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi ulnaris, extensor digitorum, extensor carpi radialis brevis, flexor carpi ulnaris, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis longus, extensor indices, extensor digiti minimi, and extensor pollicis brevis. Okay, looking at a transverse section to the wrist, we can see uh, some of the carpal tunnels. So the carpal tunnels hold the uh, median nerves, the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis muscles, the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus, and the tendons of the flexor pollicis longus. Okay, intrinsic hand muscles, opponens pollicis, abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis, adductor pollicis, lumbricals, opponens digiti minimi, flexor digiti minimi brevis, and abductor digiti minimi. Okay, more intrinsic hand muscles. We're pretty deep here with the lumbricals, the first, second, third, and fourth lumbrical. A few more intrinsic hand muscles. Opponents pollicis, opponents digiti minimi, dorsal and palmar interossei. Looking at uh, anterior view, we've got the palmar interossei, and the dorsal view, the dorsal interossei. Actually, I'm sorry, these are both the anterior view. You can see the palmar interossei, and then this cut shows the dorsal interossei. Okay, so muscles of the palm that move the digits, there are different movements, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and opposition. Okay, muscles of the neck and the back that move the vertebral column. Spinalis capitis, longissimus capitis, spinalis cervicis, semispinalis capitis, splenius capitis, splenius cervicus, Iliocostalis cervicus, semispinalis cervicus, longissimus thoracics, semispinalis thoracics, iliocostalis thoracics, spinalis thoracics, iliocostalis lumborium, intertransversarius, rotator, and multifidus. These are deep muscles of the neck that move the vertebral column. Looking uh, more cranial, we've got the scalene, the anterior, middle, and posterior scalene. And then if we go deep, posterior lateral, intertransverse area, rotator, and interspinalis between the vertebrae.
Okay, gluteal region that moved the femur. We've got the uh, a number of muscles that make the femoral triangle. So the sartorius and the adductor longus delineate one side and then the inguinal ligament delineates the top portion of the femoral triangle. So we've got sartorius, pectineus, adductor longus, gracilis, quadriceps, rectus femoris, vastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, rectus femoris, and vastus medialis. Muscles of the glutei region that move the femur. Tensor fasciae latae, sartorius, rectus femoris, obturator externus, adductor longus, pectineus, adductor brevis, adductor magnus, adductor longus, gracilis, and sartorius. Muscles of the gluteal region that move the femur. Okay, we can start with the gracilis, sartorius. We've got adductor magnus, adductor minimus, the hamstrings, which are the semitensinus, the biceps femoralis, and the semimembranus. And distally, the vastus lateralis. We look at the uh, gluteal region, the gluteal medius, the gluteal maximus as well as tensor fascia latte. Okay, the muscles that move the femur, pectineus, adductor brevis, adductor longus, gracilis, and adductor magnus. Anterior views show the rectoris femoris, the vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius and sartorius, as well as the vastus medialis. If we look deep, posterior, semitensinus, we can see the long head of the biceps, semimembranous, and the short head of the biceps. Muscles of the thigh that move the femur, tibia, and fibula. This is a cross section or a transverse section showing the different compartments but we've got the medial compartment, which is composed of the adductor magnus, adductor longus, and gracilis. We've got the posterior compartment made of the biceps femoris, semitensinus, and semimembranus. And then the anterior compartment made of the vastus lateris, vastus intermedius, rectus femoris, vastus medialis, and sartorius. Okay, muscles of the leg that moves the foot. Hello. Muscles of the leg that move the foot and the toes. Let's start with moving the foot. Um, the anterior superficial view shows tibialis anterior. Then we can see the uh, extensor digitorum longus, flexor digitorum longus, fibularis tertius, extensor hallucis longus, extensor helicus brevis, and extensor digitorum brevis. Looking laterally, we can see once again the tibialis anterior to orient you, fibularis longus, most lateral, soleus, then the gastrocnemius. Looking posterior, once again we see the gastrocnemius, the soleus uh, just behind it, when we cut out the gastrocnemius, now we can see the soleus pretty clearly. And the tibialis posterior becomes clear, as well as the flexor hallucis longus, fibularis longus, and fibularis brevis. Just a few different views. Here's the anterior view of the tibialis anterior the extensor hallucis longus and the fibularis tertius, the extensor digitorum longus, 
fibularis longus and fibularis brevis from this lateral view. Once again, look posterior, we see the gastrocnemius, under that the soleus, under that the tibialis posterior, under that, well, uh, aside from that, the publitius, flexor digitorum longus, and flexor hallucis longus. Those are all posterior views. Muscles of the foot. There are the adductors, the adductor hallucis, different lumbricals, flexor hallucis brevis, flexor digiti minimi brevis, flexor digitorum brevis, abductor hallucis, abductor digiti minimi. Looking a little bit deeper in the plantar view, you can see the flexor hallucis brevis, plantar interosseae, flexor digiti minimi brevis, the abductor digiti minimi, as well as the quadratus plantae. You can use the calcaneus to orient you. Okay, intrinsic muscles of the foot that move the toes. Plantar interosseae, there's one, two, three of them. That's a plantar view. You can also see when those are stripped away the dorsal interosseae. All right, so uh, there are a number of injuries that can, uh, can afflict the uh, muscular system, but running is associated with a number of different injuries. Uh, mostly to the knee, because that's what takes most of the, the impact. But uh, there are at-home uh, treatments you can do. Uh, there's a treatment called PRICE, but it's protection, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Then uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs or corticosteroid injections. And uh, rehab of the afflicted area. Now, a lot of these running injuries are due to not warming up sufficiently and not stretching. So a good warm up and a good stretch, and you'll be good to go. Okay, a syndrome called compartment syndrome is when the different compartments of uh, the leg will constrict or block off the blood vessels. And uh, this can lead to nerve damage. You've got big nerve uh, going down here. And the muscles can develop scar tissue and contracture might result, which is uh, a kind of prolonged contraction of this, um, this calf muscle. Okay, plantar fasciitis. This is a painful heel condition, results from chronic irritation of the plantar aponeuroses. Now, the aponeuroses is where the uh, plantar fascia meets the calcaneus, and at this meeting point, uh, there can be irritation, and walking on it just makes it worse. So the treatment is, uh, once again, your price, and uh, easing the burden on this uh, tendon, steroid injections, and then eventually surgery. Okay, that is it for the muscles. It's a lot of muscles. I'm going to give you a printout in class Saturday, and you'll... Uh, You'll see the list. We'll go through origins and insertions and really try to make sense about all this. All right, I'll see you Saturday.